I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I want to remind our attendees to please uh, feel free to type questions uh, or comments into the chat, and I can uh, pose them later after opening remarks. You can also uh, raise your hand virtually. Uh, please do that at the end of the talk, uh, or you can type a request in the chat uh, to ask a question, and you can do that live after the opening remarks. Um, and I'll be sharing some additional information um, in the chat. I'll be posting some links to some of uh, Professor Schwartz's books uh, that you can click through. I'll be posting those uh, intermittently throughout the chat as people join, uh, maybe join a little bit late. So I'll do that a few times throughout the chat. You'll be able to find links uh, to five or six of Professor Schwartz's books, um, which is just a sampling as we'll learn in a minute uh, of the, the text. So we'll, you'll see those. Um, and welcome to, uh, to everybody as they join us today. Uh, Dr. Vera Schwartz is Freeman Professor Emerita of East Asian Studies at Wesleyan University. Um, and her talk uh, today will be expanding historical empathy, how the Holocaust is helping Chinese remember atrocities of the Mao era. I want to uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. And I uh, remind you that today's event is made possible by the History Department, the History Club, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Senior Faculty Research Fellowship, the Intellectual Life Fund, and academic programs. Uh, and I want to thank uh, especially again Pamela Crossan, um, who's our, our History Department, um, our History Department everything. She makes it all happen in the History Department, and I'm delighted to see that she's joined us today. So thank you, Pam. Uh, for all the work that you do to make these events possible. Dr. Vera Schwartz uh, earned her BA uh, from Vassar College, her MA from Yale University, um, and her PhD from Stanford University. For the past four decades, she taught at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, where she was the Freeman Professor of History and East Asian Studies. She has also taught Chinese and comparative historiography in the MA program at Hebrew University. Her work has been awarded several distinguished fellowships, including the Guggenheim, the Fulbright, the Woodrow Wilson, and the Lady Davis Fellowships. She's the author of many books about Chinese intellectual history, including Bridge Across Broken Time, Chinese and Jewish Cultural Memory from Yale University Press, which was nominated for the National Jewish Book Award, and also Colors of Veracity, A Quest for Truth in China and Beyond from the University of Hawaii Press. She's also written several books of poetry in several languages, including The Physics of Wrinkle Formation from Antrim Press. These and other books will be shared uh, in the chat and also below in the, um, in the, the description of this uh, video when it's posted. Her book, In the Crook of the Rock, focuses upon the theme of Jewish refuge in times of historical trauma by focusing on the life of Rebbe Tsenkaya Walken Small, uh, who was a child in Kobe, in Japan, and in Shanghai during the Holocaust. And this book explores larger issues such as the current global refugee crisis, as well as the spiritual resources of Jewish tradition in promoting survival with dignity. Dr. Schwartz was a member of the first group of exchange scholars to be sent to China in the spring of 1979, and she has returned to Beijing often during the past three decades. The daughter of Holocaust survivors, Dr. Schwartz has made the quest for remembrance a central theme in all of her works. Uh, again, please find the links to just a sampling of these many outstanding publications in the chat section uh, in the, the description uh, below. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat um, or you can uh, raise your hand virtually or type a request to join the conversation following Dr. Schwartz's opening remarks. I apologize for the rather draconian uh, Zoom settings uh, I assure you that unfortunately it is necessary. Uh, I have everyone automatically muted uh, with uh, cameras off for now. Again, you can raise hands virtually and you can join the conversation later. You can request, uh, obviously verified Zoom users uh, can request uh, to join and ask your questions live later uh, in the event. Uh, and in the meantime, I appreciate everybody's patience uh, with this process. Um, so now please uh, join me in giving a virtual welcome to Dr. Vera Schwartz. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Murray, Jeremy, uh, collaborator and friend from uh, several different parts of our lives, including the China journey. I am extraordinarily privileged to be uh, part of this um, uh, Zoom. 
Uh, thank you, Jeremy, just fine. Just hold that one, please. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of sense of why I returned to a subject which I thought I was done years ago. And there are many subjects, including China as a whole, that I feel I'm almost done, and you never are done with China. But um, let me give you a sense. Uh, about two or three years ago, I was asked to give lectures at uh, an institute called Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Uh, that is the key uh, memorial uh, research institute about the Holocaust in, uh, in Israel, and really a global center for Holocaust research, which has been sponsoring for over four years, I, was, I came in rather late in the process, a group of Chinese young educators, young intellectuals between 25 and 34, something like that. They come from the mainland, they are carefully selected, um, and they are interested in Holocaust studies, Israel, anti-Semitism, and they spent two weeks uh, in Israel uh, studying at Yad Vashem, uh, in having uh, live sessions with survivors, uh, the Extraordinary Museum and the archives. They go around Israel. And I'm sort of the last lecturer in Chinese. And um, I come in. And I, the first time I, I gave a talk, which was really sort of something about the Holocaust, but I, be I began to sense uh, by meeting with the Chinese students, that they were exceedingly moved by the um, by their contact with survivors of the Holocaust, to the point of tears. And so I began one of my lectures about asking, "Why do you think you are so moved that you are able to cry and empathize so deeply with Chinese uh, with the Jewish survivors?" And there was quiet in the room. And then I suggested, "I suspect it's because it echoes at some level." the experiences of your parents and grandparents. And there was a deep silence in the room. The eyes were still tear-filled. And the party representative, who's always in the group, jumped up and said, of course, the Nanjing Massacre. And I said, no, no, no. I think there's more than the Nanjing Massacre that allows young Chinese in their late 20s to be so deeply moved by the, um, by the, by the experience of Jewish survivors. And I think I hit a raw nerve, but as you all know, and that many of us who have been working in China and encountered Chinese uh, young intellectuals in China and abroad, they are products of what's called the Republic of Amnesia, uh, which is the title of Louisa Lim's book that focuses on 1989, about state-enforced forgetting on the Chinese mainland about the events of 1989, but it goes deeper. Uh, and I think uh, as the party celebrating so loudly, raucously, and um, uh, its 100th anniversary this year, I think one of the things that we need to put on the table is the question of state-sponsored amnesia, which is very, very strong in China, but not only in China. And so what struck me and what launched this project is the kind of circuitous way that sometimes we take on another people's pain in order to find linguistic vessels for what uh, cannot be named or is hard to name in on native ground in one's own cultural entity, in one's own cultural context. And so one of the things that I'm curious is how we can expand what I call the language of, of, uh, of historical empathy about trauma, sometimes by allowing another culture to converse with our own forgotten or forbidden, for, uh, forbiddenly named pain. Um, Jeremy, do you mind going to the uh, next uh, slide, please? Thank you. So when I showed this uh, slide to the Chinese students in Jerusalem, um, there was pain and recognition both um, about the, 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 the memorial to victims of the Chinese Cultural Revolution and the explicit use of the Chinese Holocaust Memorial. Now, from the Jewish side, some of you might know that um, scholars of, of genocide in general and of the Shoah, the Holocaust in particular, have said that it's an incomparable event. It cannot be compared. It should not be compared not to Cambodia, not to anything else. It cannot be. It is so unique that it must not be brought into the same world of discourse as other uh, historical traumas. But neither I nor any one of us who are meditating on the subject are saying that the Cultural Revolution is comparable to the Holocaust. That's not the issue. The question is, how is the memorialization process advanced by allowing different historical traumas to converse with one another in the realm of memory, of, of remembrance. And the, one of the chief um, contributors to this uh, virtual memorial 
is Professor Wang Yu Qin in uh, Chicago, who very explicitly in her introduction to, to this site, which if you haven't explored, I would urge you to explore. It's very moving and it's very poignant. Makes the argument, I think, very uh, seriously that the, not that the move, that the, the Holocaust and the, um, the Cultural Revolution are comparable, but that the state-sponsored attack on a whole spectrum of Chinese society, which was the educated um, high party cadres or uh, scholarly community, that that was a systematic state-sponsored attack that led to a kind of a mass um, beyond hysteria, a kind of a collective uh, will to destroy part of China's population, not just cultural legacy. And therefore, uh, the Holocaust is inappropriate. Calling this the Chinese Holocaust Memorial is significant. And I think she uses that very self-consciously in contrast to what the Chinese Communist Party and the state are driving the, the, the Nanjing massacre uh, engine, which I'm very happy to talk about, because that has undergone some interesting uh, transmutations in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Very interesting and different. But you know, China is very content to talk about the Nanjing Holocaust, uh, but that's not that's politically convenient, whereas the Cultural Revolution is politically inconvenient. And so um, I want to sort of dwell on this issue of empathy. Now, if I was, you know, if we were meeting live, and if there were any Chinese-speaking students in the room, I would ask you, what is the Chinese term for empathy? But we can talk about it later, and I hope we will. If you go on Google. The most common, I think, trivial translation is gongqing, kind of common feeling, which I think generalizes the problem that we are talking about is how do you enter another's experience? And I prefer a very, perhaps an older or different term called tongqing, uh, which would be the kind of fellow feeling, the ability or the challenge. I think it's more the challenge than the ability to enter someone else's experience, and in this case, someone else's trauma. And I think that's what I saw with these young Chinese intellectuals in Jerusalem in the last few years, how hard they work in developing the tools of Tongxing and how the history they carried allowed them to develop. And I think there's no term that I can think of in English or in Hebrew. Empathy, I think, doesn't do complex justice to what Tongxing demands and allows as a deeply challenging problem of entering another's emotive realm of being, especially when the subject is uh, pain and perhaps unnameable uh, pain or, uh, or, or, or pain that does not lend itself to language readily. And I would remind us all, and I was thinking about it this morning, about Hannah Arendt, um, who's an important scholar um, you know, that fled uh, Germany and finally made it safely to the United States during the Holocaust uh, and wrote the famous book about the Eichmann trial. But Hannah Arendt was very um, uh, harsh about this vagrant sympathy. You know, I can sympathize, all of us are humans, we sympathize with everybody else. You know, I understand the uh, rape victim's feelings, I can understand anybody's feelings. And she said, that's a trivialized sentimentalization of the challenge of empathy, of what I would call the, the, the wealth of, of, of Tongqing. You know, it's not sympathize, because we really, you know, we can sympathize with everybody or nobody. But I think empathy requires a kind of a challenge that is harder and that I hope um, we at least begin to open in this little conversation. Next slide, please. Um, thank you so much. Um, the Cultural Revolution, I think, is particularly a difficult subject uh, for outsiders and insiders because of its um, brutality. Uh, the brutality, you know, this Holocaust, uh, of course, you have images, and I think if I see one more image of uh, barbed wire or, or corpses, you know, I will puke because they've been so overused and they don't um, don't evoke, I think, any, very much anymore. But I think when we read about, uh, when the first book came out about uh, Scarlet Memorial, about uh, cannibalism in a corner of southwest China, it was meant to shock, but it was shocking. Um, you know, and, and scholars have been discussing what was there cannibalism, how widespread it was, but I think it, it does evoke a kind of a horror for which I think we still do not have names, as does, you know, uh, the, the image from the Cultural Revolution that I picked about, you know, the pen as a sword. But uh, we're talking about actually, you know, a very, very murderous moment. 
and um, with, then this image that uh, was put up in this uh, one and only, um, and I'll come back to you a bit in a few minutes about the Cultural Museum, Cultural Revolution Museum problem, but it shows the bloody heads of, of the Red Guards. Uh, so this was really, uh, I think, a, a murderous moment in Chinese history. And what makes it so much more unbearable is that it was an internation of Sorry about my phone, I'm about to shut it off, excuse me. Um, it's bothering me. So um, that it was really Chinese people doing it to Chinese people. It was not only what was required, but it was really going beyond what was required. And I think, you know, we've seen instances of extraordinary cruelty in the Holocaust, and again, we can talk about some details later. But I just want to, to bring up the emotional difficulty of developing Tongqing when you have your students killing your teachers, when you have children attacking their parents, when you have younger cadres attacking and killing and humiliating older cadres. It's a very intimate kind of violence that's very different. Some of you might be familiar with a very graphic, very creative um, um, cartoon uh, meditation on, on the Holocaust called Maus, M-A-U-S. Um, by a son of a survivor, an extraordinary artist, and when you have the Jews portrayed as cats, uh, as mice, and the Nazis as as uh, as cats, and so you know those are different. You know the the cats are really vicious, and the mice are quivering and vulnerable. I think that you can't um, come back to that. It's not so divisive in China. Everybody went between being a victim and victimizer. And that's a very interesting conversation, which we continue. But I think that's what makes this particularly um, difficult. Um, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, because I want to talk a little bit about Yang Jisheng, um, who just published the author of this book that you, uh, you have the cover here on Tombstone, which is an extraordinarily dense and important um, documentary about the Great Famine, which um, the numbers about how many unnatural deaths just happened between Chinese, uh, 1959 and 1961 or 62 vary, but um, we're talking about dozens of millions of people killed uh, or, or, or uh, died of famine uh, by, because of the atrocities perpetrated by the state, by its economic and political policies. And what's interesting about Yang Jishun, I think the title of the book is very evocative and his introduction is very moving, that he wanted to create a memorial. He wanted to have something to remember his father, who was one of the victims of the Great Famine. And Yang Jishan just published another book, which I didn't put on the PowerPoint, about the Cultural Revolution. It's not as long, it's not as densely documented, though it is, about the atrocities of the Cultural Revolution, but it's called, in English, I think, um, The World Turned Upside Down. And it's the marvelous Chinese simple um, saying that some of you might know, about um, um, uh, heaven and earth trading places. Uh, uh, heaven falls down and the earth changes. And it's this feeling of, you know, in four Chinese characters, a world gone mad, topsy-turvy. But, you know, in the English, topsy-turvy sounds fun, like you're on a carousel. But when Yang Jisheng, after having published um, Tombstone, goes on to the Cultural Revolution and details as many other Chinese high-level agent intellectuals have tried, not that anything is publishable in China yet, but often outside, um, to talk about what does it mean to, to live in a world in which none of your values, none of your visions have a sense of steadiness. And um, I think the, the, the question here, uh, and I've been rethinking, I don't know how many of you read or I know, about the, the Cultural Revolution memoir published rather early by Yang Jiang called Six Chapters from a Cadre's Life, um, a very, very powerful and exceedingly understated recollection of her own uh, couple of years sent down to the countryside along with her aged husband, Qian Zhongshu. I think what makes the book more interesting with the passage of time is the husband's introduction to the book about the missing chapter in the publication called the chapter on shame. And I think this is what hangs over the whole question of empathy that I want to uh, hopefully discuss with all of you, is 
the burden that I think lies so heavy and still rather unspoken in China about having participated, that the victims were participants to some extent. Nobody was free from non-participation in the various atrocities that took place on the Chinese landscape uh, during the Mao era. And I think here is where the, I think the Holocaust, I think when these young Chinese intellectuals come to Jerusalem and are allowed to listen to survivors, when their grandparents and parents are keeping quite little, and this is not matter, deathly quiet, not only about 1989, but about the previous um, experiences of hardship and of terror and of trauma, that silence becomes so deafening in the absence of uh, expression. Whereas when they come and they sit with these aged survivors that have been giving testimony, um, is really an uh, extraordinary thing to witness. The next slide, please. Um, there are many things that one can, I just, I think this is just a powerful moment that I want to just raise really as a question that we can discuss. Uh, you know, you can talk about the, the cultural revolution. Again, they're not comparable. But I think what the, I wanted to put this, and, and really, I, you know, even in Chinese intentionally, so that the Chinese young students would understand what the question was, is how does culture or people who are cultured become criminals simply for who they are? So you have a picture of this Chinese general being um, tortured by uh, Red Guards. Uh, and, you know, you have this airplane position, you know, arms pulled backwards, uh, often, you know, very forcibly his head, you know, Pushed down the the his uh, the, the the placard on his neck with uh, um, you know metal um, uh, steel or you know uh, metal um, you know thread that digs deeper and deeper and leads to bleeding as he's sitting there being pummeled, being shouted at, being accused of everything he never did, and I think it's so intimate. You know, you have its hands on, saying you do not exist. We are here to erase you from existence even before you die. And the same thing with this picture in front of the Ukraine where you have uh, Nazi and local officers uh, shaving the beard of a religious Jew. Again, you know, the pleasure, the, the, the kind of, if you will, the pornography of violence that, you know, just because you're Jewish, just because you have a beard, maybe you embody some kind of Torah tradition that we're gonna erase by starting with your beard. We're gonna just create a kind of a physical um, trauma that will probably result in, in a, a far greater um, humiliation, most likely death. And so I think it's, it's really a reflection about, uh, about violence. Um, and you know, it made me think, uh, again, as, as thinking about this talk this morning, or uh, this afternoon for you, this afternoon for me morning, lunchtime for you, about the Lord of the Flies. You know, when, I think when the Chinese young people come to Jerusalem and think about the Holocaust, one of the questions they are asked to think about, would you do this? Would you be part, would you be part of such a picture? And of course not. None of us would ever imagine a world that's so tenfadifu, so upside down, that we would hurt another being so directly, so brutally. And yet, and yet in a collective setting, especially one sponsored by state power, would we not, like William Golding's book, torture a fellow of our community to death? And I think that's one of the things that, again, I would like you in your seminars or in your conversations with each other, you know, no, not me. It's too quick an answer. And I watched the young Chinese struggle. Would they be part of the Red Guards? Would they beat up a teacher? Of course, the answer is no. And then comes the second, third wave of thought. Well, maybe yes. Well, maybe yes. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm trying to keep this short. Um, I know I'm speaking fast and I have an accent. So um, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm happy to have the conversation at length and at a slower speed as soon as I finish, which is just in a few minutes. Um, the question of the Museum of the Cultural Revolution. There isn't one in China yet. There were a couple attempts. They were shut down during the Xi Jinping era, which is the current era. Um, there is this uh, museum in the boonies um, outside of Chengdu um, that I showed the initial picture about the, um, the uh, bloody hands. It's by a real estate um, magnate who is the son, is the son of, of a victim of the Cultural Revolution. And quietly, because he had a lot, of, he has a lot of money, 
he began to collect cultural evolutionary memorabilia. And there was a wonderful article about the industrial museum complex. He had huge, I forget how many hangars full of Mao statues and also a huge amount of very well-preserved cultural revolutionary documentation. It cannot be shown. The Mao statues can be shown because they're sort of, you know, key art. Um, and Sichuan has a special political history that for a while allowed him to do this work. But it's clearly still, um, uh, it's, a, it's a forbidden zone. So there's a kind of, there's a, you know, many people are collecting stuff. There's non-official uh, memorabilia. There's several powerful films that had been done and had been um, shown before they were uh, taken up about uh, listening to the voice of survivors. But you know what Vajin, the, the writer that um, you know I'm quoting here, that what he had called for as a cultural revolution museum um, rather early in the 80s after Mao died and after Deng Xiaoping allowed for a period of uh, openness, was a museum to take off your face, to exactly do what Qian Zhongshu was writing about um, in the preface to his wife memoir to begin to talk about shame, to again, to talk about participatory, not guilt, because guilt is not a useful term in this context, but allowing oneself to be part of, um, of the story in a darker fashion, a darker museum. And you know, when they go, when you go to the older version of the Nanjing uh, you know, uh, massacre museum, and you see one more image of a bayonet, you know, through a Chinese woman's uh, private genitals. You know, th those are images that suit the state and we are oversaturated by them. What kind of images would we need in a darkened um, setting to begin to think about the cultural revolution as a moment of participatory atrocity? Um, I don't know, but I know that the Chinese students that I talked to and mentored in Jerusalem and continue to because they attend my seminars, they are thinking about this question. It's a painful question. Uh, but they are, in a few decades, they might have an opportunity to think about what would it look like to allow, and I think the 9-11 Museum is studied also, you know, what do you show? Not the pornography of violence, not the, you know, the marvelous uh, wisdom of Chen Mao, something else. And I think Vajin, in the quote that you have before you, was very early on trying to envisage such a site which has not yet been built. The next slide, please. Um, this is a question about bearing witness, uh, which is, um, you know, um, something, of course, I, I think uh, Professor Perry Link might still be on. Um, I hope so, because I'm deeply indebted to him, and he wrote the, the preface to uh, Romina Hur's book, Tiananmen Exiles. I think the question of bearing witness, which is a big theme in Holocaust literature, is being brought to the foreground of um, Chinese memoir literature, especially after 1989, but using 1989 to gaze backward to the Mao era, what it means to, to bear witness. Now, uh, Professor Link and maybe Jeremy, others you know, who know Rowena her well, and I've been privileged to call myself a friend, know the great price that she and others have paid, the 1989 uh, uh, witnesses, have paid for their acts of witnessing, whether it is death, uh, writing essays every June 4th or going to Congress to testify, clearly they cannot do it in China, they're not able to return to the mainland. Um, their families were put at risk. Um, and Rowena Hill herself, especially, is now in Hong Kong, where she for a while taught, was allowed to teach a course on Tiananmen. And now the university is preventing her from it. But she's managing by looking at other moments of atrocity to lead students into unofficial conversations about the moments of historical trauma that are much closer to them than the Cultural Revolution or the Great Famine or some other of the moments of the Maoist atrocities. So I think, and, and I know that Rowena um, and I were planning, you know, I don't know when and how, to have a kind of a conference reading group on how Jewish literature, which is very fulsome on the question of witnessing or witnessing the witness, those of us who are bearing witness to the Chinese courage. And of course, this is most poignant in Liu Xiaobo, uh, the Chinese intellectual who died in prison, who got the Nobel Prize, um, please the last slide, uh, who was, I think, the most conscious, um, uh, self-crafted uh, witness um, to the, he refused to forget 1989, talked about what it means to be 
to live in the Republic of Amnesia in China, and Hans was not allowed, and Perling was in Oslo when he received the Nobel Peace Prize, and hence he had the empty chair uh, that Liu Xiaobo could not take. And again, how few are those Nobel Prize winners who are not allowed to take, including, of course, a victim of Nazis um, uh, during the, the, hit, the rise of Hitler, Hitlerism. So China doesn't look good when we look at the, the empty chair for Liu Xiaobo, uh, the, the, the figure that is now looked at as, as a model for active witnessing. Now in Hebrew, uh, to be a witness, to, to give testimony in this sense of, um, that I'm using, is called edut, which can be also in a court of law, but it does mean a larger sense of, I am here present for those who cannot speak. Now, this is different than Marx's, you know, we must represent those who cannot be represented. You're not speaking for the victims. Liu Xiaobo was very careful not to speak about those who were killed in Tiananmen. But he said, they trouble my nights. They will not let me speak. And I think one of the things to bear witness is to be troubled. And that's why I like to, um, to use this quote from uh, the ancient mariner. I'm not the first one. Some of the, the writings about the Holocaust use the ancient mariner who um, is famous poem by Coldridge, um, who is, is the sole survivor of a uh, shipwreck. But he will not forget. And he carries his albatross and shows up at weddings and troubles the merrymakers. You know, we just want to, Deng Xiaoping told China, let's just forget it. Let's get on with socialist construction. That was the message of the late 70s and early 80s. Let's move forward. No need to dwell upon the darkness. But they are troublers. They are, they are ancient men who show up, who trouble the wedding feast. And certainly, Deng Xiaoping is, would, uh, and uh, Xi Jinping would like everybody to just forget about June 4th and just move on. You know, and my own little part, you know, is when I interviewed um, Zhang Shenpu, which is the picture there, me with a much younger incarnation. And the book that I published about uh, my uh, research with this aged, forgotten founder of the Communist Party, who was kicked out, left, and suffered in, 1950, uh, in 1957 and during the Cultural Revolution. The book itself, when it came out in English, it was called Time for Telling Truth is Running Out. And I very consciously felt the responsibility to bear witness to something that could not be spoken about, including about the, the, the history of the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party that was laundered in a different way than I learned to tell it a little bit in more complex fashion. When the book came out in China, and I'm grateful that it did come out in China, it was called Conversations with Zhang Shenfu. Here's a foreigner seeking wisdom from an aged Chinese. Marvelously great picture. Uh, China has a lot to teach to the West. I am attentive. He's old. He's wise. It fits the state narrative. And the book, more than one third uh, of the book was cut, maybe a little bit more. I was happy to, for it to be cut just as long as it reached uh, the Chinese audience where it really belonged. Um, the picture on the, uh, on the low, lower side is Zhang Shenfu's younger brother, Professor Zhang Danian, who I interviewed first about his brother, and then I became friends with him. We attended several conversations, uh, conferences together. In 1989, on May 20th, I was walking with Zhang Danian to Tsinghua University, where there had been a huge conference in his own honor as uh, on his 80th birthday, scholars all around the world, all around China to attend Zhang Danian's uh, conference. And it was a day that martial law was declared in Beijing in 1989. The streets were closed. Tanks were beginning to appear around the university. And Zhang Danian and I rode our pushed our bicycles from Peking University to Tsinghua. And you know we passed uh, the, 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 the military presence. Instead of hundreds that were expected, there were about maybe 18, 20 people that managed to show up by bicycle. Buses, of course, from the Social Science Academy had been canceled. And Zhang Danian turns to me on the way to, to Qinghua and said, Shu Hongzhe, Zaman Yu Zhiyin, Ni Shi Yu Taiyuan, Zaman Yu Zhiyin, Professor Shu, uh, he called me by Chinese name, Shu Hongzhe, um, because you are Jewish, you understand what's going on here. We have what's called Zhiyin, wordless understanding. You understand what's going on here. I don't need to spell it out. There's a tra and we talk, there's a tragedy unfolding on the streets of Beijing right now, and we can't talk about it, but because you're Jewish, yeah. you understand. And that again brought back long before, you know, this is 1989, in 2019, I'm talking to a generation of students who've never heard of 1989 or are not allowed to talk about it. But there was something about 
what I felt I was mandated to do by Zhang Danian. I did understand. I'm not sure I understood as much as Professor Perlink and others who were there um, understood. Uh, but there is some, a conversation about what it means to let the historical memory of one culture speak to and in a way create a, a uh, container for the unspeakable memories of another. And I think that's what I'm hoping the conversation today and your conversation with each other will continue about what it's like to be, to hold another people's memories or what it's like to turn to someone else's historical uh, grief in order to try to understand your own. Because sometimes the, the long road home, if you will, the circuitous journey is more effective than confronting it directly. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you again for your time, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Vera. Um, I have a couple comments in the chat that I'd like to lead with. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop. Um, okay, great. Let me uh, see everybody. I'll move to the uh, gallery. If I can hold up the gallery view. I will allow I folks, if people want to go ahead and turn on your video, you should be able to do that. And then I'll invite people to um, to to uh, unmute if they like. Um, let's see. I have a question first from Dolly Chinitz. Um, she logged on a little bit earlier and and introduced herself as a friend of yours, Vera. So oh, I want to and delighted. Uh, before you say anything, can I say something about Dolly because she's extraordinary, of and I hope that uh, it's very late in Jerusalem. I can't believe she's up. Um, Dolly herself is a survivor. 91 years old from Budapest. Um, she's been widely interviewed, including most recently. I urge you to, um, if Dali could send the link or I'll send you the link to her various testimonies. Um, of, talk about somebody utterly unsentimental in discussing the Holocaust and how she talks about it and what are the values that she feels are important to speak to younger generations about. So I'm extraordinarily privileged to call Dolly my friend, to have in this conversation a survivor of the Holocaust joining us at this late hour in Jerusalem. I'm extraordinarily moved. And, and she's worthy. I hope that you can see her face because I can't. But uh, I've gone ahead and, and invited Dolly to unmute if she wants to. Um, uh, so Dolly, you, you should be welcome to unmute if you'd like to. She, um, if you to sleep, that's fine. I will send and her, you her, her testimony. She sent, um, uh, she, she did send, oh, yep, there's, there's Dolly on the video. And Dolly, you should be able to unmute if you'd like. I have your uh, question here. Um, let's see. Uh, Dolly was asking uh, about Mao. She was asking at what time was Mao discredited and how is it possible that he is still revered? Um, how is it possible that China today is still a communist dictatorship? How come if he was not quite discredited, uh, museums uh, can be erected memorializing atrocities. Uh, and I hope I, I characterized your question properly, Dolly. Um, you want to answer you... it because you're one of the experts on the subject. <laughs> um, I think, it, first of all, look at the eloquent language in which Dolly, whose English probably is her seventh language, you know, Hungarian, Serbian, Croatian, uh, Spanish, French, German, and finally, the, you know, so uh, again, that's just one of the extraordinary uh, things that we learn from survivors is, is the multiplicity of languages in which they live. Um, I think it's a question that we're asking today because under the era of Xi Jinping, Mao has been coming back more and more, um, including personality worship uh, that uh, I've uh, just been writing about. I think it is the uh, Jeremy, I would like you to chime in on this, but I think the fact that there's so much enforced forgetting about the atrocities of the Mao era allows a younger generation to just join the fun. It's kind of an iconic, you can buy keychains, you can buy plates, uh, Xi Jinping, Chairman Mao, you know, um, you know, there's been articles about what happened to Chairman Mao's hometown. It's almost of a, of a kind of village cult. You want good luck, you kind of rub your Mao keychain or your Mao picture. So there's a, a, a kind of a a bottom-up um, uh, losing of allergy to atrocity. But I think the fact that the state is using the Mao's legacy to enforce party dictatorship right now allows for the, uh, uh, and, and, and speeds up this um, 
this lack of remembrance about atrocities, a lack of talk about atrocities. And by the way, I would love some of the Chinese speakers on the hard, how do you translate atrocity into Chinese? Uh, I'm talking about, you know, it's, it's, you know, talk about lexicons, you know, and that's really what interests me. So I would love to hear that. I think why does communism endure in China? You know, the party will tell you because, and I think there's some truth, stability. I think one of the legacies of the Cultural Revolution is dread of instability. One, the fact that China can disintegrate. And you know, many, we can have endless conversations about why Deng Xiaoping called in the army in 1989. But I think there was a communal fear of where, was, where is this heading? How, dis, how will the dread of China falling apart? Now, China is not going to fall apart. Uh, China is, you know, I think this calls back the, the warlord period and the imperialism. All these things are mushed up together so that while we can't allow either remembrance of atrocity or anything that might challenge the enforced unity of the Chinese state. But I think that's one of the reasons why communism endures in China because it's synonymous with uh, stability and increasingly and ironically with tradition. So, you know, this, which I'm writing about, about Confucian communism and what does that mean and how long will that melange last? But it's a great question, Dali, which is, you know, a 91 survivor from Budapest thinking so deeply and urging us to think deeply about these questions. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Dali. And I, I want to go on and make sure that um, we get a couple more questions. And I think, um, uh, this is such a such a complex issue, and I don't have much to add uh, to, to Professor Schwartz. But I, well, I, I think there's a kind of um, uh, there, there there there's the kind of half-hearted reckoning, seventy percent, thirty percent sort of Politburo sort of language that that goes in thirty percent wrong, seventy percent right, but not really specified where the wrongness was, um, and and it prevents. It allows maybe a kind of pressure valve in, in the, on the ears of some, but it also prevents a kind of serious reckoning with the legitimacy of the party as, to be, as the sort of single, single party state. Um, but it was quite a, quite a remarkable sort of sleight of hand to make the dramatic change from Mao to Deng Xiaoping in terms of a lot of policies and see that as a continuation. And then again, this happens in the major transitions and transformations that have taken place over the last um, eight, five or eight years or so that are, that are, that are so, so, so fundamental in China that also, um, that, that also are, are being framed as continuity and development. So this, this, the, the, the framing of these really profound reinventions of, of the grounding of the party, which obviously isn't Marxism anymore in a, in a sort of substantial way, um, but that's such a such a such a um, sort of I don't want to say sleight of hand, but 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 a sort of uh, massaging of these these really profound transformations into a, a story of continuity that takes the legitimacy. Uh, Xi Jinping says Mao brought us revolution. Deng Xiaoping brought us wealth, and and uh, Xi Jinping says I will bring you know greatness on the on the world stage. And there's this sort of legacy that's that's kind of reassuring you see this kind of continuity but do you see uh, just following on dolly's question because i i really think it was important in terms of the public we had kirk denton on uh last uh, year week before last talking about museums and in museums and film these are such highly processed um forums for for memory for collective memory you talked about a local museum um is there is there the possibility of of popular and these these very highly processed uh, media for for public memory like museums and film for reckoning in the way that Yang Jisheng is doing? He he goes from the Great Leap Famine in the late fifties to the Cultural Revolution. Is there a possibility that that will also be tracked um, in these more popular popular forums like museums and film, or is that not really on the horizon at all, in your view. In my early incarnation, I read and wrote a lot about musification. There's a whole literature about museums and what they can and cannot tell. And, you know, we all started with uh, Pierre Nora, the French scholar, who talked about uh, places of memory, that the more museums, the less memory. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the more statues, you know, 
Uh, so whenever we build memorials, we kind of say, okay, that's where memory lies and I can, so, um, you know, there's a, that's the drawback of the over narrated, over exhibit, you know, we, we just put it there and we move on. I think one of the things that I've been realizing with Chinese students when they came to Yad Vashem is that Yad Vashem has worked very hard, probably one of the museums in the world, is not to create linearity. It's not from the bad to the good, but to create complexities, you know, and, and, and of course the, the, the way they work with um, architecture and, you know, uh, the idea of a broken line. So, you know, I think the, the Jewish, um, um, there's the same, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, Leben, what's the name? Lebo, the, the guy who designed the 9-11 memorial also. We actually designed it one museum in, in uh, Wuhan uh, to Jiang Zhidong, interesting, and, and played with, with themes. So I think, you know, we identify museums with these, you know, granite or brick structures where we narrate the story, which is almost like the Mao to Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping story. You know, like a storyline, we tell it, it's in, you know, we put it on the wall and it, it's explanatory. I think in the last, um, as the world reckons with the complexity of witnessing, uh, combining oral testimony, combining, uh, you know, not so it, it just making the narrative more complicated. As a writer, obviously, I believe that in uh, in writing or maybe in certain performance arts or abstract art, there's more room for lacuna, more room to tell the story um, in a darker and more nuanced fashion than it might be in museums. But let's hope that that's, let's try to have a museum. And I think interestingly, um, the this uh, and and um, I will actually want the the uh, June Fourth memorials and conversations in Hong Kong and in Taiwan have allowed the kind of Chinese thinking about what memory would look like and what you know it's not merely grieving uh, and I think Ruo Xiaobo had a, a nuanced vision of memory so um, I, I want to you know until we have regime change because I don't think this regime can. And I think what you said is uh, 7%, 30%, that's, you know, um, eluding specificity until you can um, be specific. And I think that's, you know, so much about Latin American, uh, for, you know, writing about witnessing, you have to be able to name. And I think unless you, you know, name, name the loss, name the place, name the date, name the person. And I think this is the, the what Yang, Wang Shuijin is doing on the, on the Holocaust Memorial online is names, they're not, the, not 10,000, which are more than that, but she and others have researched specifics. And I think that's how, it's, that's the memorial, specificity. And as long as it's 730, it's the dancing away from specificity. So um, I think um, that, that's the challenge. Of, of, uh, and, and very soon there'll be no generations left. Uh, you, know, it's never, you know, Dali is unique, not you want, but you know, not about the Holocaust. With the Cultural Revolution, we might have some time, but I think Yang Jishan has done a great, really, um, act of witnessing for posterity. Not only the details, but who he is in China, an aged party cadre, trying to tell it, naming it. And I think that the, the challenge to name is a very, very big one in, in this question of expanding history. I can, you know, I can sympathize with poor people all around the world, but unless I know someone who's in need, you know, and, and this is Hannah Arendt, it's a much deeper conversation about what constitutes empathy versus sympathy. But I need specificity to be able to enter your realm. Uh, by the way, I just was talking to a friend about Thomas Merton, you know, the Trappist monk, who wrote, to my mind, the best book about Zen. You know, he was a Catholic monk entering another religious framework because he understood it, understood something inside that allowed him to understand the other. So it's this kind of dual challenge that we all face. Thanks, Farah. I want to invite um, uh, Jamie or Jaime uh, to, to ask your question. Please go ahead and uh, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Professor Murray. Um, Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I'm a new student to this area of, of study. Um, I find your point quite interesting in that um, this is a cultural revolution. And as thoughts are brewing in my mind as you're speaking, uh, couldn't help but compare um, some US history, the US Revolution versus the Civil War. And what are your thoughts on this being a cultural revolution, uh, but having some similarities to possibly being a civil revolution as well? You're talking about civil war as an internation affair. 
Well, I, I'm talking let about me, this, let, me the, the, let me hear your, your own reflections, because I thought you were going to go to George Floyd immediately, but go ahead. No, 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 no. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm thinking back about the Cultural Revolution, where you're mentioning that, you know, this was um, uh, victims becoming uh, also victimizers. You know, this was the same people committing atrocities against their own people, right? Where I think historically many people think of uh, Holocaust or revolutions or wars being um, one, say one um, type of race versus another one, such as the, the Holocaust where the Germans- the cats and mice, you know. That's it, exactly, that's yes. And and so, you know, my thoughts were um, just again, comparing to, to some American history where uh, in US, the Americans, the Newfound Americans were fighting their English oppressors, right? And, but later on in history, we had the Civil War where it was two different uh, thoughts, uh, trains of thoughts where the North was fighting the South for different reasons, correct? And so I, I'm looking at this um, cultural revolution as possibly also having some cultural revolution connections. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I hope you develop it. I, I, I'm just gonna have you know, uh, reactions to what you said. I just came back from Canada visiting my, uh, one of my sons there. And there's a museum in Hamilton to American loyalists. I, you know, a whole big, big, big two block museum, you know, kind of cast to Americans who fled to Canada because they were so loyal to the British. And my son who's of course American born, but he said, wow, you know, look, us Canadians, you know, are celebrating American loyalists. So it's interesting, I, I didn't think about that. What happened to American loyalists, you know, and, and here our good neighbor Canada erected a whole memorial to them. And so hmm. let me turn it around. And I guess, uh, I think you should think about, and I hope you do, explore historical facticity. You know, what would historical fact that can help us think about them? But obviously, because of recent um, events in America, and my own sense, just watching, seeing from the outside this, uh, uh, this uh, loyalist uh, memorial in, in Hamilton, um, what is, who's memorizing what? One of, you know, I think the question of historical empathy and this back to Professor Murray's question about museums or memorials. What do they do? And the, we, what we do as scholars or as conversation partners, you know, you can't converse with, with uh, the dead of the Civil War, but you can. You can. And I you know I believe the conversation with history goes deeply and, and we are enriched by conversing with people from the past, even though their language is quite literally different from ours, even if we have English in common. Um, but I think the question is, um, you know, so the fate of the memorials to the Civil War right now, and what's, I think the country, so what is this country want to remember? And how, you know, I remember when I was participant in dozens of conferences about the 9-11 Museum, uh, because I had done this work on, on, on memory and memorization. And the question was, how much time has to elapse before you can remember an event? You know, our, our so one of the things that you know from psychological literature says, let's say an accident, witnesses to an accident are the least reliable because they were there, they were shaken, they can't be trusted. We trust camera, you know, so do we need a temporal distance from the event in order to remember it? But how much temporal distance? 10 years? 10 years? How much time do we have to be a way to be able to begin to create the rhetoric of memory? And I would say even empathy. I mean, if you are injured, of course, I will come to your aid, but that's different. That might be sympathy, it might be, you know, just because I'm responsible to, for your well-being. But what I'm talking about is a kind of a historiographic gaze that is empathy driven by the, how much time do I need to be elapsed? And I think the, the thing about the, the Civil War right now and how it aches America, it can't be put away. It's a sword that we keep, um, uh, the scab that we keep picking at um, because of racism and because other reasons. And you know there was a thing about the cultural uh, the nineteen uh, the cultural revolution you know when they when there was a period very short period of the literature of the wounded, and they said you know enough of picking at the scabs, you know so are we just scab picking or are we trying to do something else? It's a question back to you, but I hope you tackle it. I, it's a great question. Thank yeah, that's you. a great question. Thank thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, I'm in. And a, a quick a quick question from Anthony, uh, I'll ask on his behalf, and he wanted to know how long you've been doing these these studies. And I, I, I don't know if he's talking, I think, specifically about memory work. 
Um, he said it's it's very interesting, very cool, and 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 he appreciates your uh, your you. talk very uh, much. What Anthony? Anthony. Yeah. Uh, hi, Anthony. Well, I wish I wasn't doing it anymore. I'm. Uh, I think I've been doing it for the last four years. Years, and when I wrote the last book, uh, not the, a few weeks ago, anyway, on on um, gardening in 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 in, uh, in, in the corner of uh, Beijing about the destruction of uh, the 18th, uh, 19th century and taking it forward to cultural revolution, among other things. You know, it's uh, it was called uh, Place and Memory on Zingling, I forget already, Place and Memory in China, I forget the title of the book anyway, but when they were deciding on the title, I said, no more memory. They said, well, that's your sin. So I feel sick and tired of the memory, but memory studies have advanced. I just did a review for a journal called Memory Studies. So you can look it online. Um, somebody wrote an interesting essay about the character for forgetting Wang in Chinese, in Confucius and Shenzhen. So memory studies are just gearing up. I've been at it too long. I want to get out, but it doesn't seem to be possible because I meet these young Chinese that are crying in Jerusalem, and I feel like I need to respond to their tears. So it's a very hot subject, including and interestingly in neurobiology. I've always kept an eye on the scientific aspects of memory studies, and they're really, really interesting about how we met, uh, what, how do we, what, what are the biomarkers of memory, which part of the brain, how much memory constitutes a personality. Um, it's really interesting. So I invite all of you who, who can do bridge work between science and historiography to, to, to engage in these disparate literatures because it's hot. And I'm trying to get out, but other and successfully. Thank you very, very, very. I, I want to welcome again everybody to to join. Um, please, if you need to run to class, and Professor yes. Schwartz already noted this, if it, we're at the top of the hour, um, we can also continue the conversation for another fifteen. Um, if there are any questions at all, please do jump in, but but don't feel remiss if you need to step away Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, um, I'm grateful for your uh, making time for this in your busy day. Thank you. I re really appreciate this. I, I love the, the use of the, the albatross uh, image and the, the sort of troubling the wedding feast idea. I thought that was really, um, uh, really, it? Uh, it was, it, 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 it was, I, I think that is something that definitely we see in, in this country as well in the conversation surrounding race where they, there, there's, uh, there, there's this take, even among sort of non arch arch reactionary racists you you see among some sort of well-intentioned liberals or sort of moderate conservatives this sort of conversation why can't we sort of why, why can't we 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 all you know forget about this this sort of illusion of the post-racial society and and that that sort of dialogue i i was wondering I think, let me let me just because you're mm -hmm. a historian and we're being sponsored by history department i guess i would like to say that good historians are like the ancient mariner, that our job, among many things, is to trouble. I think if we don't trouble the conscience of our contemporaries, we somehow amiss. I mean, I don't mean about blame. Uh, I think white guilt has gone far too far, and it, you know, it's, we're not talking about that. We're talking about illuminating corners of the past that challenge and converse in a way that expands um, the present. And I think that um, I think if we do our work well then we are the ancient mariner. And you know, I, I, when I began hundreds of years ago, um, the, the work on memory studies, you know, and I began to reread re Freud because I'd already read him. You know, and, and the basic Freudian assumption that if you forget the past, it's gonna come up, you're gonna get hysterical, you know. The, the, unfro the, the, the forgotten past in a personal narrative will accost you and explode and trouble you in ways that you're even not prepared. So the argument was, let's bring it up. Um, and then I start to do Chinese research. And uh, I did mention two things I want to say, please. Uh, one is about Professor Yu Ying Shi. When I was working on the Bridge Across Broken Time, I went to Princeton um, to, to talk to Yu Ying Shi. I was talking about giving a talk about Zhang Shengfu, the forgotten founder of the Communist Party. And I had a long time to talk to, to Yu Ying Shi about memory and language of memory because I was just beginning to enter the subject. And Yu Ying Shi said, Vera, forget about you know this Jewish obsession with never again. You know, go reread the Ho Han Shu in the late Han Dynasty classic. There's this wonderful medical discussion of the forgetting, how, how healthy forgetting is, that mental health and Buddhists talk develop that forgetting is very important. And I went and I read the Ho Han Shu and 
I acknowledge in the, you know, the book honors Yung Shu. Seven years, less than seven years later, Yung Shu calls me up. I was doing teaching in Jerusalem. Vera, you must come to a conference on Nanjing Massacre. There are all these students that don't know nothing about Nanjing Massacre. 1997, the first mainlanders had arrived. And so we need to learn about Jewish paradigms of memory. And I said, but Yung Shu, I'm not a scholar of Jewish memory. I do China, remember? But I went to this conference in which Yung Shu, an aged historian felt so compelled to bring to a new generation of Chinese students, because at that time the Nanjing master had not yet become the political capital that is in China, to try to teach. He wanted to learn about never again. So it's really interesting about how, um, how this works. And I want to say one more thing about Perry Link, who really is, should be giving this talk and to whom I'm so indebted in every which way. And I exchanged um, emails with him a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, about what will happen in China on June 4th, 2021? And he said, you know, which I knew, not, probably nothing. You know, Tiananmen will be locked down. Nobody's going to have remembrances. But that we will, that we must. So again, here's a notion of those who cannot remember, that we need to have a framework for historical empathy that creates avenues for commemoration, that, that those who cannot, that we will do something for them. And we'll do something not on their behalf with them somehow. And Perry will lead us and has been a leader in creating um, this, this, and I think with Liu Xiaobo and, and, and 1989, Perry has been the, the moral um, anchor for many of us who look to how we can, how do we create these containers and, and, and expand them for historical empathy. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. I, um... I had a couple questions and, and anybody can, we, we have about 10 minutes. So anybody should please feel free to raise hand, uh, raise your hand or, or type into the chat. Um, but a, along these lines and in terms of sort of what you, what you think might happen going, going forward and looking at the reckoning of other countries, whether it's Germany or Japan or the United States with, with, with their past, do you think that an increasingly um, confident Chinese Communist Party may lead to space for deeper reckoning. Uh, that that is increasing security in its in its power. If if that's the path forward, um, of of uh, uh, starting with these these sort of tighter restrictions, then maybe leading to. Uh, I I I don't know. I, is is there a path further toward? A kind of intense authoritarian and authoritarianization, um, a, a point at which security can possibly lead to a deeper reckoning with this past. Um, that is a sort of path, a, a, a very not not a very positive path, possibly leading to possible out uh, positive outcomes. Several thoughts. It's a great question. I think you again, you and your students will answer that, not me. Uh, but let me, so I would like you to, to uh, so uh, let's say, uh, and again, I'm being um, hyperbolic, but let's say about rape victims. Let's wait till I, I'm older, more secure, have my own children, and then I will remember, uh, I will tell the story. Uh, sounds good. Not likely, because things will happen. <laughs> that will accost your, you know, there's, there's one, you know, I, and I, again, I think individuals and states are, you know, you know, miles, you know, eons apart, but there's a question, you know, how much security do you need to have as an individual, as a, as a country, before you can face the darkness of the past? Has Germany, is Ger you know, and, and people look at Germany, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the book that uh, came out a couple, less than a year ago, uh, that compares American dealing with racism and Germany's facing its Nazi past by a philosopher who now lives in Germany. Um, I will, sorry, just pausing on my radar to think about it. But um, her argument uh, is that Germany has made significant past, uh, you know, uh, peace with its, uh, its um, Nazi past, whereas America has yet to confront its uh, racist past. And I think the last year and a half has certainly showed us that Germany is far from having made peace with, you know, I mean, I don't know, the, the demons are stirring in Germany very strongly and not simply because of the immigrants. So it's complicated. You know, the, the unremembered past is in a way never put to rest. Now, China would, 
and I guess the other thing that came to mind is really in a way, and I haven't had, you know, you, you and Sharon and I, you know, correspond sometimes, and Rowena Ho, this extraordinarily brave woman who's bearing witness to 1989, is my bridge right now to you and Sharon. So I know that you, but, you know, what came to mind is that in Chinese culture, you know, you and Sharon, when I talked to him, in, you know, bef you know about when he said, you know, you Jews are too obsessed with never again, that there's something, not just Deng Xiaoping, not just Xi Jinping, that just says, let's move on. Uh, especially that I have to work with somebody who was on the other side of the, of the group. And I think that makes it, you know, why bring up ill feeling now? Because we have to go to work tomorrow and the day after. And what do I gain by dragging up old ghosts? And I think ghosts and being haunted um, is, is a, a, a complex. So I think there's something, a kind of a social, cultural milieu. I think Chinese culture itself, and it was interesting now that I think about it, uh, that this article that I reviewed for memory studies, that it's about forgetfulness and non-forgetfulness. I think there's something, you know, certainly the Dao, the Dao De Jing and aspects of Manchus, you know, forgetting is better. Forgetting is a key to wisdom. So Xi Jinping writes his memoirs that talk about a little bit about his hardship during the Cultural Revolution. He does, and being, you know, but he's a good student of Chairman Mao, and he hopes he'll be just like Chairman Mao right now, and everybody will love him and honor him. So they're complex issues, so I don't know. And thank God I'm a historian and not a political scientist. What do you think? I'm curious. I, I, I think I agree. China make peace with its past. I mean, on a, on a personal level, when I, when I speak with, with friends and, and colleagues who are in China, I see, a, of, of course, and I'm, I'm sure you and, and Perry find this as well, a, a willingness to, to have these really complex deep uh, reckoning sort of conversations. Um, but I think that the, the sort of brittleness of uh, the legitimacy of certain kind of movements, you know, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party or here the Republican Party, there's a kind of brittleness that says we can't have that conversation because once we open that, it's, it's going, to, who knows where it could go? I don't know where it could go. You know, it could, you know, it could be again, the, the the world turned upside down and, and there's this invocation of the cultural revolution as a reason for not engaging with these, 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 these complicated, messy conversations. So there's the, there's the invocation of the event itself as the reason for not talking about the event itself. Um, but let me give you uh, the flip side, which I guess I would in, encourage students to compare the historiography because you're teaching that. I think that's maybe uh, that studying in other people's culture, and I think especially in the Holocaust, is really one of the most well researched and widest lexicon for some of this. And um, to give an interesting and uncomfortable example, um, Professor Zhang Shi, uh, Zhang Nong Shi, a friend of mine, teaches in Hong Kong. We met uh, two summers ago in Stockholm at the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement. And we were having breakfast. Uh, and then, and I was asking about the events in Hong Kong because it's just beginning to get intense. And he was sharing some of his um, ambivalences. And he went back. And then I got an email saying, Vera, I just lived through Kristallnacht when the university library was shattered by demonstrators, which, you know, and I saw pictures. Now, you know, when I heard from Hong Kong, Vera, I lived through Kristallnacht. So, the, you know, it, it, it raises, you know, so we're not gaga about democracy, or we don't only read the I think by having a, a historical framework, uh, and you know, Zhang Hongxi has been studying comparative historiography for literature for many years, but it doesn't help you get better through the night when, of the shattered glass of, of the library in Hong Kong. But it does give you something. And of course, right now, we're not gonna talk about Kristallnacht in Hong Kong, because you know, the security law is, is you know, becoming, you know, so many people are being arrested and persecuted. But there is another side. There's, and I think, as historians, as scholars who do comparative work, we fill in the dark, I think, shadows. You know, I went to Peking University and you know, talked about enlightenment, you know, so I'm very invited, but I said, let's talk about shadows, not light. You know, and I think every time I go to Beijing, I, I feel like I need to talk about shadows. Uh, a shadow wing, you know, the grays that I think we are compelled to do and to document. That's a real, I like that way of thinking about it. That's, that's really good. And we, um, we can do it, we are enabled, we have the tools and the freedom. I, I wanted to ask one more question, if I can, 
uh, and, and that is something I've, I, speaking of Perry, I've troubled Perry and, and, and others with this question. Um, in these sort of polarized moments, whether it's the American partisan polarization or the polarization between Beijing and Washington, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the use and, and misuse of good work toward bad ends and whether this is something you give thought to or, uh, or whether, it, whether it troubles you or whether it's simply a, a fact of life that um, the, I remember the, the, the Kipling line, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. That is if, if really good work um, being done being misused for for nationalistic purposes or for or, or or even even twisted in itself for 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 uses other than your own these landscapes of history and memory that you engage with are so fraught and often so um so polarized uh, i was wondering if if you had any thoughts on that dynamic in in terms of your work or if you simply say i, I the work is out there and and Fools may make of it what they will, and I can't control that. Um, I think Perry is um, an extraordinary example of moral courage in our field. There are others, but I think Perry, um, if I had to give a prize for moral courage in China work, he would to that question go to, to Perry Link. Um, and at the same time, I think Perry would agree that we don't control the ends to which our work is, is put to. We do the work. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, and I, again, thank God I'm not a, a political scientist. I'm a historian. Um, but I know that our work can, can be misused by nationalistic purposes. But my experience, and I think Perry is significantly as well, has been that we are counted upon by some people, by set up in China to do this work. So whatever is being put to use in Washington or in Beijing is less important than using our knowledge, our connections, and our training to, to create spaces, uh, whether it's by inviting Chinese scholars, continuing a conversation, or writing things that they cannot write. Um, and I think it's very, very important to um, to do that, so um, uh, that uh, that would be you know that it's a responsibility we cannot abandon, with uh, and not and not even clutter with concerns about what usage it will be put by Washington. So Project Kipling, I think we try to dig at truth as best we can. That's really encouraging and and really helpful and and very clear. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Barry so Schwartz. It's, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, and uh, we have Stan Rosen next week, Professor Stanley Rosen, talking oh, about Hollywood, uh, Hollywood and China and China and Hollywood, uh, another fraught landscape, uh, an interesting landscape. So please join us then, everybody. Um, this has really been a, a, a delightful, delightful conversation, as, as fraught as the subject matter is, really wonderful and enlightening. Enlightening again um, in the shadows. Thank you so much, Professor Schwartz. I will follow up with you by email um, and we'll wrap things up. Thanks everybody for joining and thank you, Professor Vera Schwartz.